All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Anil Mahadev. I'm a solutions architect for Embarcadero Technologies here in Austin. Uh, I just got to the uh, US uh, six months ago, and I've been uh, with this company back in India for about three and a half years. So my day job is to uh, mainly do uh, solutions architecting for and pre-sales for our database tools and application tools. And in my spare time, I, I also uh, take care of some of the cloud-related initiatives within the organization. So today's topic will be uh, talking about how to actually get started with absolutely zero knowledge of Microsoft Azure and how you can actually spin up your very first SQL Server instance and what will be the considerations you'll have to take uh, during the process. Apart from this, a little bit additional information, I was very much active in the SQL Server user groups in India. I was also the primary incubator for the IBM DB2 user group uh, in India and the SAP Sybase user group as well. Six-time IBM champion for the information management platform. I'm currently focusing on SQL Server and cloud solutions uh, uh, where I work for. You can follow me on Twitter at SQL Server Cowboy and my blog at community.embarcadero.com. So here's the agenda for this next uh, 45 to 50 minutes. We'll be focusing on an introduction to Microsoft Azure. What is the role of SQL Server in Azure today? how to go ahead and set up a SQL Server in an Azure VM, some basic troubleshooting tips, where you may uh, get stranded and how to resolve them, and finally, we'll take a look at Q&A. And this is gonna be a hands-on demo, so the first question, how many of you have ever used Azure? A raise of hands. Okay, so probably, the majority of you are, are definitely a, a great use case for this presentation. So Microsoft Azure is the cloud implementation of uh, AWS where you offer cloud-based services in terms of uh, databases, you can have virtual machines, you can set up your virtual networks, etc. things of that nature. And Microsoft Azure has got various uh, uh, tenets uh, within its entire ecosystem. The, uh, uh, the Microsoft Azure platform encompasses the uh, IaaS, which is Infrastructure as a Service. Then it encompasses the Platform as a Service. And also it encompasses Software as a Service. So Infrastructure as a Service is Azure Virtual Machines, some of the hardware related infrastructure that powers your backend, all that uh, comes under the infrastructure. The platform as a service, such as .NET related capabilities, Azure mobile services, these are some of the platform areas that you can think about. And the final uh, part of it, software as a service, where you can set up your Azure Active Directory to have a certain number of applications that are running that, that can be connected to your Azure instance. So for example, uh, you might take a look at Salesforce or Dynamic CRM, those kind of things, yeah? So what is the role of SQL Server in, in Azure? It comes under the umbrella of uh, the infrastructure as a service where you can say even database as a service where you actually pay for the uh, services for the time that you use. SQL Server, <coughs> Ever since it was introduced in uh, Azure, start off uh, with the 2008 uh, R2 uh, services, and then it went on to all the way up to the current 2014. So we'll uh, have a look at, uh, in the demonstration, uh, what are the various key components and what uh, you'll be going ahead and doing. Now the third part is setting up a SQL Server uh, uh, instance in Azure VM, 
we'll be going through all the parameters that are needed to set up a SQL Server, and we'll use uh, an application to connect to that particular SQL Server, and we will see a scenario of where do we get stuck and how do we resolve it. Any questions? All good? Cool. So I'm going to switch to my Azure instance. How many of you here have MSDN accounts? Okay. MSDN Pro or just any specific? It really doesn't matter. I'll give you a rundown on that. MSDN Pro gives you up to $50 a month of Azure services. The MSDN uh, Premium gives you up, uh, up to $100. And the Ultimate gives you up to $150. So if you have that benefit, then please make use of it. All you need to do is to go under your MSDN subscription account page. There you have uh, Microsoft Azure. Then you click on that and activate the benefit, and then you should be good to go. So here I have signed in into my Azure um, instance, and uh, here you can see on the left-hand side is your uh, the various Azure Services Explorer that you can see that uh, are part of the benefit. And in the middle here, you can see that I've chosen the Virtual Machines section, and it, it gives you all the information related to that particular service. Now the first thing you have to do is, as a best practice, is to go ahead and set up a, a virtual network. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go to Network Services, Virtual Network, and let's do a, a quick create. I'm going to call this Cactus Virtual Network. Here you're given the address space that you would like to use, either in the 10 dot range, 172 or 192.168. We'll stick with this. And then here you can choose which region you want to do it. Since we're in Texas, we'll choose South Central US. And the DNS server, if you want to have any global uh, DNS based on this, you can choose that. And you also have in Azure, here's the cool thing, if you ever have any uh, questions about any of these uh, 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 terms or services, you can actually click on the help menu and you can get information about that. So we'll uh, leave the defaults as such and we'll go ahead and say create virtual network. Now the reason behind creating this virtual network is the first step in, in, in going ahead and setting up your SQL Server environment. The reason being it will be in the same availability zone so I'll talk about availability zones in a minute, but it's just to make sure that your SQL Server environment is in the same address space so that you can get access much faster. Now the next step, here, as it is going ahead and creating this, let's go ahead and create storage for our virtual machine. Let's go ahead and say new, data services storage. So let's put it, let's give it a URL. So I'll just call this as Cactus SG. And the affinity groups, either I can choose South Central again, or already since I have the virtual network associated with it, I can go ahead and choose that. And replication. Now, locally redundant replication will enable you to have it only within that particular region. Geo-redundant will have it across the globe. Read access geo-redundant will make sure that this is like sort of like a read-only access for, so that if you want some uh, reporting data after some time that you want to go ahead and have some access with the storage, you can do that. And zone redundant. This is as per the particular zone that you wish to have. So we'll choose locally redundant for now since we are not doing any high availability stuff. <coughs> Let's go ahead and create that storage account. Just give me one second here.
Ah, okay, I see the problem. So we'll wait for this virtual network to get created. And while it's getting created, we will go through some of the key areas on the types of virtual uh, machines being available to us. How many of you have here have worked with virtualization in the past or ever? Okay. So as you all know, uh, the cloud is nothing but a virtualized server being connected to the internet, but being serviced to a whole bunch of people that, that want to consume it. So in Azure, you have two options. One is you can either do a quick create, which has a pre-configured set of settings, or you can choose from gallery. Now this is where it gets really interesting where you can choose from setting up a base OS with absolutely nothing installed, all the way up to a Dynamics or a BizTalk server or even a SharePoint. So our interest is obviously Microsoft SQL Server. Let me just use the magnifier here. So here you have a bunch of options which shows you all the list of, of Microsoft SQL Server that's available. Let me just scroll down right at the bottom. So just almost a couple of days ago, uh, Microsoft introduced SQL Server 2008 R2 SP3 uh, web, and uh, they've been patching all these uh, servers uh, from uh, uh, the last couple of months. So here you have a choice of uh, SQL Server all the way starting from 2008 R2 all the way to 2014. Now it all depends on what you're trying to do and how, on what all features you want to implement in your SQL Server environment. That's the first question you would ask. Then let's say that you want to go ahead and utilize all the enterprise capability features and uh, let, uh, so, you wanna, uh, so you want to go with Enterprise Edition for example. If you just want to go for, you know, just a web load or just for any kind of a website, you can go with the, uh, the web edition as well. Now, it gets really interesting when you look at these two uh, virtual machines. Uh, 2012 SP2 o Enterprise Optimized for Transaction wor Workloads and Data Warehousing Workloads. When you set up these two types of virtual machines, uh, Microsoft actually goes ahead and provisions two dedicated drives just for the data and the log files. So that's transaction oriented. And plus, they have a lot of optimized scripts that will actually be optimized for those kind of workloads so you don't have to do all the initial groundwork of that. That's the benefit. And finally, we have the same thing for and also if you notice one thing, they even have these OS combinations that you might want to replicate in your environment but don't have access to on a physical box. So sometimes what happens is that if you get a customer requirement to actually build something that's not possible in-house, then you can take a look at Azure and implement it right off the bat. So while is there let's go back and uh, let's go back and check on how we're doing with yes sir yes sir <coughs> I just want to mention that the pre-configured SQL VM templates will be charged at a higher rate because you're using the license so if you're using your MSDN subscription and you're limited to or yep. Just build out a regular server and yep. then put SQL on top of that via the MSDN downloads. And by the way, downloading from MSDN to one of those virtual machines is really fast. Yep. That's a great point. <coughs> so let's go and, uh, and see how our virtual network is doing here.
So it's gone ahead and created the virtual network. So let's go ahead and now focus on the storage. <coughs> go to the storage section. Create a new storage account. This is strange. It's, uh, it's, it's not displaying here. Cool. Let's go choose this. So what we would usually do is to associate that with the virtual network and the virtual network or the zone that you're planning on implementing the storage. And this storage is mainly meant when you're actually provisioning your uh, virtual machine. You can refer to this storage account and, uh, and build on it. It's going to resolve the DNS. Okay, excellent. So let's now go ahead and create a new virtual machine. Go to file name and let's go to from gallery. I'll just show you the quick create as well. So let's so the only option in the quick create is that you can go ahead and specify the sizes. So as as Mark indicated, the larger the VM size the configuration the more you'll be charged by the hour. And Microsoft has introduced a new set of virtual machines called D machines, which have solid state on it. So if you really want to do some real high performance testing and you just want to get it over with within a short period of time, then these D machines are, are, are recommended. So let's go ahead and create a Windows uh, uh, 2008 R2 SP3 Enterprise with Windows Server 2008 R2. The only reason I'm creating this is in the interest of time, because all the others will, will probably have a lot of time and, and configuration. So I'm going to be a bit ambitious. In the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and put in D3, four cores with, with 14 gigs of memory. So I'm going to call this and one best practice that I've always ran into is for getting usernames. This is something that you will experience even though you've been using it a lot of times. I lost my password, I mean the username once. I knew the password, but I couldn't figure out the username because the, uh, the virtual machine was a different name and this was a, a different username. So in order, as a best practice, if you can keep the virtual machine username the same as your VM, that would be really good. What? No. <laughs> I know. Local admin, yep. Right. Right. So here we have, it will go ahead and create a new uh, cloud service. Now, a cloud service is basically sort of like uh, your, it's mainly uh, used within when you're using more than one virtual machine in a container. And also, it helps you in, uh, in load balancing as well. So right now with the affinity group, I'm going to choose the Cactus virtual network as the affinity group. And then let's use the storage account here that we have created. Availability set. If you want this to be uh, geo-redundant and make sure it's availability in case of a, a failure, you can do that. But right now, we don't need it. Now, I'm just going to 
I'll leave this as the defaults and I'll tell you why in a moment. When it comes to the virtual machine configuration, the, uh, the VM agent is by default uh, a recommended uh, installation because if, you're, if you want to do some automation stuff, you can actually install some of these Chef and, uh, and Puppet. And this VM agent will also help you in having all these security uh, stuff also installed. So let's go ahead and create that virtual machine. This will probably take about close to five minutes at the max, hopefully. So here you have the details of actually being setting it up. Now, uh, one of the main advantages is that you don't have to install SQL in this kind of an en environment. But if you want to have control, you can actually just spin up a, an operating system instance or a virtual machine and install SQL on top of that. But this is for the get-go. You just need something that needs to be up and running. You have a, a POC. You want to uh, set up a similar kind of environment then this is probably the most easiest and most recommended way to go. <coughs> also, uh, take an on-prem VHD and copy it to your schematic. Turn it into an image. If you just press it, you can turn it into an image. Because you can call multiple times. So if you just, like I, I've got a Super Server 2000 machine. Uh, there is an on-prem virtual machine that I built. The HD Insight is, uh, is Microsoft's version of Hortonworks. Yep. It's basically the Hadoop implementation. Yep. And that's another area I'm getting a lot of traction from our customers is how do we actually work with big data today? But we don't have that kind of data. So even if you want to have a, a look at a sandbox, you could either get the sandbox from Hortonworks directly or set up the HD Insight implementation here on the shore. And also, there are a lot of other new services. I mean, uh, Remote App is, has been added uh, uh, just recently. And Active Directory, so if you were to actually go ahead and set up a, a test environment that you want to work with a similar domain controller and you want to simulate a high availability scenario, you could probably set this up in Azure as well. And one of the reasons, main reasons of, uh, and, and so as it is saying that it's creating the virtual machine, you will see that it's also provisioning the virtual machine. So the, the provisioning process is where the actual installation is taking place. And that's where it, <coughs> it actually does all the all the groundwork but that's the reason why I also specified of, of using a 2008 that might be much faster on these installs and a 2014 or a, a 2012 so while this is getting provisioned let me just spend some time on uh, on the dashboard so as you can see here, it says it's in, it's provisioning in progress. And what you need to keep in mind is the DNS name. Then you have, it, it assigns you a public virtual IP. And then this is the actual IP that you will be using to connect to the instance. And also, uh, if you have the actual a URL that you want to put it and uh, access it from a web server. So you can give this URL and have IAS being set up on the virtual machine to for your web application as well. 
And here's a, a word of warning. If you see this host name as a dash, don't ever click on the connect button because you're never going to be successful. It will not connect until you see all the rest of the highlighted icons, which is restart, shut down, attach, or capture. So uh, that's one of the uh, areas you need to pay attention to while implementing Azure. Yes, sir? Well, it all depends on what uh, kind of data you're trying to put in the, in the cloud, right? So uh, Azure, in my experience, personal experience, I've always benefited from uh, using Azure from a solutions perspective. Like for example, if I have a, a lot of POCs, I work with a lot of our customers who, who want POCs. So they will say, oh, we don't have the hardware. Do it in your environment. So this is a, a great way of doing it, yeah? And in terms of security, I do agree. Security is obviously you don't want to put all your data in the cloud. That's not the way it goes. But if you want a real easy to implement solution that can actually replicate your customer environments in real time, this is probably the way to go. Your experience for, me? for me, uh, Knockwood so far. The uh, my customers actually, our customers are uh, are are usually the prospects who evaluate our tools in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what they do is that they either say that it's available or it's not available. That's it. They only say that we cannot get to your site. That's it. So we have to get into Azure and either just restart the VM and and everything works just fine. In fact, right now we're actually working on a. Uh, uh, my boss and I are. Uh, we are working on implementing an automated uh, uh, restore system, like a nightly uh, restores, mm -hmm. so that if anybody were to come in into our environment, they would do some edits with the uh, application, it would reset to the re regular database. So every evaluation is a clean evaluation. So. I'm sorry, I missed something. Did yep. you say that that VSM was public-facing, like you could say with the laptop right here and go to that? That's correct. You will see that, especially if I have, uh, but right now, I have not enabled the endpoints. So that's why I told, uh, once we implement this, once the, the virtual machine is all set up, I will show you a couple of key scenarios that where you might get stumbled upon and how do you can fix it. This was just the setup process and how you can uh, leverage by getting started. Let's see here. So from a security standpoint, you can, uh, so in, in this example, we're just using the public internet to get to the things. Uh, from your side, you can set the site to keep the internet, so that's secure. We also have an MPLS service to store if you want to keep the MPLS on the side directly to the laptop that the site is going to come in. And then SQL be next. You would have post that encryption in SQL, that transcript data encryption, and then you can ask for SQL, so the version that one's going to be a little bit of a thing that's going to be. We're going to have in flight transcript so that the application on that can only be about it. So that's very simple. So it's very, Azure is very secure. USA, we passed all of them the certification class. And USA just recently said, okay, we declared that we're doing that. We're not going to do that. It's very secure. We're not going to do that. 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 And oftentimes, you have to realize what application do you want to actually implement in Azure? So sometimes it could even be as a simple internal test for your internal organization users that you can actually go ahead and set up a quick test environment for them and, uh, and, and make use of it. And commodity hardware, although it's being uh, affordable, with these kind of implementations to implement them, I mean, who will actually sit and install SQL Server today? unless they're forced to. 
because we've heard in SQL past that the emergence of the cloud DBA is evident now. So we need to be ready uh, for the cloud to be prepared. The on-premise isn't going every, anywhere. It will always be there for some of the key uh, data systems out there. And uh, yeah. So when you say though that the Azure is, uh, mm -hmm. so long as you pick what you need, just like what you, what you do on your on-premises, that it would be cheaper because you have to infrastructure costs? IT infrastructure costs and also the thing of maintaining that hardware especially for example I mean let's take a simple example here in Azure I can actually once the actual virtual machine is up and running I can actually reduce or increase my virtual memory size and I can do all these settings on the fly and a very good example I can give for you is Azure websites Azure websites gives you the ability to actually spread out uh, the performance uh, between the web application that you can actually implement. So if you're using a free website today, Microsoft Azure uh, uh, websites gives you a free website that you can have. And uh, if you want to increase the performance and the availability of that, you can actually, uh, uh, just through, uh, uh, through the settings, you can increase it. Okay, so now it is actually running. You can see that we've got a host name, so that's good. Now, to answer your question about the public DNS, let's go back here. I'll go back. So let me just go ahead and Right, so we're having the virtual machine like this, dashboard. So now, if I were to go ahead and just try and go to this cactus north vm .cloud app, it's still struggling to connect. So your answer to security, this is locked down right off the bat. If, and the way you find that out is by going to the endpoints. So right now, I can, I can do a remote desktop or I can do a PowerShell. Mm -hmm. Now the first thing for a SQL Server DBA to implement in the Azure environment is to actually go at it and see what they have there. So I have a, a, an RDP file. It gives you a, a nice RDP file here. So let's go ahead and hit connect. That's your password. <laughs> That's not yours. <laughs> and also, uh, whatever the RDP file auto generates every time, gives you a, a unique number. So it's not 3389. You got it. Yeah. So I'm just at it, yeah. The, this one will, uh, the uh, port 80 again, only if you give it as at port 80 by default. You can actually get to that uh, website, but if you specify a different port, obviously it'll be unknown apart from yourself, unless you publicly say that we're connecting with this port there. Yeah. So it's preparing the desktop right now. So this is what you get as soon as you I implement your first SQL Server instance. So it gives you the internal IP. This is for use for both SQL Server. If you're both on the same virtual network, a group that we just created. You can have, uh, it'll, it'll probably say 10.5, uh, and here it'll have a different IP, that's it. So this is all your standard Windows stuff. You have all your server that you wanna have access to, and the public firewall, here's uh, where you can actually give. Now, let's go ahead and uh, I'm just gonna add uh, a particular feature here. Let me just go here. I'm 
just going to quickly go ahead and add a, a web server. And while it is doing this, I'm going to go back to my Azure portal and go to the endpoints. And I'm going to go ahead and add an endpoint. Now, an endpoint is nothing but a, a firewall exception that you would add for making sure that Azure can communicate and respond. So I'll just leave it at, at 480. In any case, I'll be turning down the VM once this is done. Let me give it a name. So here, here's a, a list of already pre-built ports that you can use. So if I just said HTTP, it will take in 80 here. So let's go ahead and, and create that. And while it is doing this, let me go ahead and copy the IP address. I'm going to go to my management studio. Go to my connection. Let me go back here. Now, now here's the thing. Did I choose a password for my SQL Server? No, right? So how do we fix it? So if I were to use the same password that I used for logging into the RDP, there's no chance that it will get to it. So. The way of fixing that is by going back to the Azure portal in the, I'm sorry, the uh, remote desktop. So now we have a web server up and running. So if I were to go ahead and refresh this, you can see I get IAS. Okay. So let's go back to the remote desktop. Let's go to all programs, Microsoft SQL Server 2008 R2, Management Studio. So let me just put this in. So this is a common error that we all have seen, right? That it cannot be found or instance of that. So the primary reason is that Microsoft implements Windows authentication by default as part of the install. So once we launch Management Studio, we can go back there and change it to SQL auth and, and connect. Is your machine in a work group or a domain right now? It's right now in the work group. You can add it to a domain if you wish. You can actually uh, set this up as a primary domain controller if you wish and add that as well. You can actually, as a best practice, as what we've been told over the years is that always install SQL Server first and then add kickstart a domain controller. But most of the times we've seen that database servers are, do not necessarily have to be on the same domain controller, meaning they can join a domain, but they cannot be the primary. So if I have SQL Server installed, I cannot, I, it's not recommended that you would actually set this up as an Active Directory server as well. So let's go to the security. So here you can see that the SA login is, is disabled. So we solve that by going under Under security, we'll change the mode. It's asking for a restart. Let's go ahead and restart this instance. And by default, it it does not create named instances. It creates always it always creates a default instance. So let's go ahead and do this. Go to logins. Now this is disabled. 
So how would you go about installing the main Gensons on that machine, or would you just create a new virtual machine? No. Uh, what you would do is you would actually download the installer for SQL Server from your MSDN, okay. and then install it, and uh, and obviously it'll uh, detect the existing instance, and you can just go ahead and add a new instance. So here, if I were to uh, uh, kickstart a new install, it would say, would you like to add more features, or would you like to install this as a new instance, right? So the first thing, and again, under status, it's obviously disabled. You enable this. So let's go ahead and test this out. So you're in, right? So this works. Now let's see how it'll work with if you were to connect from the outside world. What do you think will happen? It'll work? It's because I didn't specify the endpoint at the Azure portal. In the Azure portal, as you notice that I could not connect even to the web server first. So the endpoints are, are vital. Yeah, so there was a SQL there, so let's go ahead and let's fix that. So let's go to the endpoints, click on add. So here you have MS SQL. Here for all intensive purposes, we'll leave the, the same port, but not to be done on a production-based implementation or any other sort. We'll change the ports. You can change the ports. You can keep the uh, public port to something else, and the private port, you can keep it to 1433. So once the update finishes, we should be in a position to connect. Awesome. So let's go ahead and try it again. Okay, now can you tell me what the problem is? I'm still not able to connect. Any thoughts? No. Uh, not Windows Firewall. Uh, it's been given an exception. Yep. SQL Server Configuration. So here, by default, although it's enabled, now let's go and restart the services. Is this Wi-Fi not allowing me to go outside? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I enabled it. Let's see here. So, oh, uh, you mean the one four three three? Yeah, y yeah. Uh, okay, let's see here. Yep, 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 yep. 
default. You have to do something special in IIS to allow that to go through. Not IIS. Uh, this is a SQL uh, thing. So if we were to actually go ahead and also, here's another issue that you might encounter. What's the next obvious issue that you think? Remote login? It's a firewall. So, let me go and uh, firewall. We'll go here. Advanced settings. Inbound rule. New rule. Port. One four three three. Allow the connection. Okay. You have to do that for an on premises install. The on premise the on premise as long as it's within the firewall and they're all on the same network. You shouldn't have a problem with that. Hmm. Strange. Which one? Yeah. Because I'm. It's fourteen thirty-three. Yeah. Yeah. So he's just got an app yeah to security actually right. security right Let's see here Let's see. yep so it took a while it took a while so now we're in so now you can actually go ahead and build your databases do all the good stuff and you're up and running. So let me ask you this. If it's sure. A short answer to it. If you knew and you hadn't seen me go through that, how would you know that it was a file or you wouldn't be missing something in the network? No. There's no, no. It's just that if you have done an on-premise uh, SQL Server thing, and these are some of the common error messages that you would encounter, that's probably it. But if, if, if the person is absolutely brand new, if he's a cloud, specialist in your organization and he just wants to get SQL Server up and running, yeah. this is all the steps he would need to do. That's right. Yeah. Oh, no problem. So because... The related question is, you sure. find one article on Technic or MSDN and you had to go big, big, big and all the big articles? I had to uh, learn stuff the hard way. I actually had no... Uh, I, I watched a lot of uh, videos but still, for any new user, this level of detail and explanation was not given. So I thought, I'll learn, I'll do all the hard work, and probably, this is probably the best way to present it. So. And also, it also helps you to appreciate SQL Server in a much more different uh, limelight as well. Because you're working with all these databases, you're being given the task of setting up new servers, and might as well do this. And what Mark was mentioning about the automation thing that's coming up, so that's something which is next on my agenda. Because obviously, if you want to uh, uh, replicate similar environments through this automation by spinning up so many virtual machines, I mean, I'll give you an example, uh, Xbox. Xbox, for their gaming servers, they're using Azure. <coughs> so just think of the, the level of, of throughput that they need. Here, I just give you a simple virtual machine, which probably wouldn't even take much time to actually go ahead and implement. But if you look at it, and also in terms of the performance, you can see that this is really highly performant. So if I were to go ahead and, and do this, now let's go back to the <coughs> remote desktop. And uh, if you were to see here, I just refresh this. 
obviously the same database is there. So it's it, it's pretty fast. And with uh, also another important thing, very, very important thing. You see this temporary storage? It literally means temporary storage. So which means as soon as I did the mistake one time by placing all my setup files that I needed to build my environment, I shut down the virtual machine and boom, gone. Because my understanding of this first, of temporary storage, was you could use this as a place where you could store your spare installers or something like that, but as soon as you refreshed it, it's gone. I mean, I mean what a waste of 199 gigs, right? Seriously. And, and by the way, the uh, virtual machines that are having the optimized workload, here uh, Microsoft has got a set of drives that are dedicated for those workloads. And can, you, can any of you guess what is the size of those drives? Almost a terabyte plus. So it's pretty large. So uh, you might be thinking, what am I going to do with that space? Well, apparently some customers are definitely utilizing a lot on that front. So, okay, so that was a, a quick whirlwind tour of Azure, of SQL Server in Azure. We focused on, on some of the troubleshooting tips, how to get started and everything, and around the uh, along the way we went and also set up a lot of uh, implementations in terms of endpoints. We learned about virtual networks. We also uh, learned about some of the basic stuff as we as DBAs we look at in terms of troubleshooting, like the configuration manager, the firewall, the key main issues. So I would like to thank you for your attention and for uh, coming over and attending my session. Uh, please uh, share uh, your feedback. That was awesome. How about that? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Time for Q&A. We have another 15 minutes, and then we can wrap it up. Yes, please. So how would you compare, like, a SQL instance on an Azure box to Azure SQL database? Azure SQL database has three concepts, right? They have blobs, they have the uh, storage uh, mechanisms and all that. So SQL database is actually a database, but you don't have the full power of doing replication stuff and also having these kind of uh, optimization techniques that you would do on an on-premise database. So SQL Server in, in virtual machines, that's why I call this SQL Server in Azure VMs. So it's not SQL Azure or SQL database anymore. So if you're uh, referring to what's the key difference, that's probably for another session. But that's the main key difference between a SQL database and, and SQL Server in an Azure VM. Yes, sir? So when you created the endpoint for SQL Server, why didn't it create the firewall exception? And you have to manually create that? The firewall so exception, that yeah, uh-huh. I had to create that because uh, oftentimes, even at the OS level, it is pretty secure. They have gone and implemented it that way. So unless you implement the uh, exception, uh, add the if you had turned off the firewall at the OS level, it still would uh, uh, have allowed you to connect. But the the whole idea of adding the exception at the Azure level is that even though you've enabled it here. But if you've disabled it at Azure on the portal, it'll not allow you to connect. So the endpoint is a yeah. service layer. And so that external facing ID is the same for every machine you're going to have in that cloud service. And the ports, and so the cloud service will take an incoming request on a specific port. Like you were specifying the actual ports that usually you would specify some type of port number. You'll take that and map it to your internal IP and for you know, 1433 or whatever you specify. And so, like, I've got one cloud service with seven different virtual machines. <coughs> the same IP address for every machine, a different port number, which then maps to 3303 
Access point, yep. Okay. So when you set up when you start with Azure, you'll set up something called a cloud service. And that's your your network will live in that and any of the machines you spin up will live in that. And then if you wanted so you could have like completely separate entities with their own individual work machines, their own individual networks within Azure at the same time. And then you just get different cloud services. So what kind of data you would use if you had one cloud service, two people server? That's, that's a great that's a great question. So what I do is as often as possible, I try to create independent uh, cloud services so that it depends on what I'm trying to implement. So let's say if I want to implement a replication VM. So I call it replication VM dot cloud app dot net. And then for the second virtual machine I call it dot uh, two dot cloud app dot net. That's probably the best naming convention. It's basically if you're trying to do something in SQL Server for that particular task, it's always a great uh, naming convention that you want to implement. So, so if you have two of the same functioning box, or two boxes in the same role in the same cloud, your endpoints, if you want to use different port numbers, can you name your endpoints though with the... Uh, yes, I would name the endpoints accordingly. Yeah. For, for myself, yeah. And that's probably one of the easiest ways because obviously you cannot have the same endpoint on two on, right. on two different boxes. Right. Yeah, right. So yeah, you don't want to get confused, get confused right? That's right. And always as a best practice, this was just in the, in terms of a, a quick demonstration and overview, but your uh, humble recommendation is please just for the public ones, give it a very complex one that nobody can guess. And obviously, if it's public, then obviously they'll be trying to figure out which is the port, unless they're, they're trying to be <coughs> smart and trying to run some port scans or something like that. But so, so if you do a POC for a customer right. or for somebody, sure. what, what, do you, what do you typically turn over to them to have them go check it out? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the first thing we do is, um, uh, we actually go ahead and implement uh, a sort of like a, a architecture diagram for them based on what the requirements are. And based on that, we connect the dots by saying that this is where the Azure piece comes in and this is where your database would come in and this is how easy it is you would access it. Then we would point to a URL and tell them, you know what, just go ahead and check it out here. Right here. That's right, absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes what happens is that uh, the extra layer of security, and in 2012, it can get a little more secure, more than the 2008 R2. It all depends on how much of hardening, server hardening you want to implement. So you can actually go ahead and implement all that by yourself, yeah. So this seems like it would lead to an explosion of IP addresses. Yes, yes. Well, well, <laughs> basically it's all going about spinning up. And again, it depends on the class of IP addresses, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're, I prefer the class A always because it's just a lot of less people tend to use that. Right, right. And even to implement these kind of uh, a VM to VM communication, you hardly ever run out of this so, one. so are the cloud services, are they allowing, I mean, are they taking one IP address and then multiple people use it, but they somehow know how to route? Yeah, basically how they have is uh, uh, right now in Azure, they have something called uh, Traffic Manager, I, I think it is called. Let me just see here. Yeah, so they have a, a service called the Traffic Manager where you can actually go ahead and and create and see how you want to route each one of them. But as of now, from a cloud service standpoint, here if you go under cloud services, if I want to go to my, 
uh, VM that I just created here you can see where the actual IP is and all the port endpoints that are there all this is all there yeah um, sure I think that the textbook paradigm for exposing um, Web pages, having your web server in the DMZ, yeah. and then having your databases in your special application right. behind the firewall. And all right, right. How do you implement that type of paradigm in, in the Azure cloud? Yeah, so we have, um, Mark mentioned this about having your connecting your on premise environment with this. So you can implement something like that. And in terms of the virtual network, it can actually get uh, uh, you can make it as complex as you want. So, for example, you have your local on-premise network, and then here you can actually go ahead and, and set up your specific custom create. Or if you have a, co a configuration that you have already set up on-premise, you can import that as well. I mean, uh, there is, I think, a white paper... Um, uh, that we have, uh, I will, I will, I will do some research and I'll send it to the uh, the folks and uh, and we can share. Is there a way that we can share content uh, with the group? Is there an email address or something that we can share content? Yeah. Is there a, a methodology in the, or a way that we can share some content with the uh, members of the group? Uh, sure. Yeah. So we can. Is there? Do you want to share? A uh, slide deck or some kind of white paper that I might not have right now on me, but I can do some research and give them to, uh, give it to them. Yeah, you send it to me. I can sure. Email the distribution list sounds great. Put it on the also. Sure. Sounds like a plan. We'll get that over for you, sir. So, so what's the difference between the virtual and the local network in this context? Yeah, in this context, it just mainly means that this is going to be the publicly accessible set of virtual networks between the actual uh, uh, virtual machines. Internal, so the uh, local uh, network is your on-premise. So here I have a on-premise environment, which I've just given a sample. When you say on-premise, what does that mean? On-premise is your local, your local active directory, your organizations, in your building, okay. yeah, in your building. That's on-premise. And here you can specify a list of DN uh, DNS servers that you want it to go through. So if you're having any preferred uh, DNS, you can actually set up those DNS servers as well. So that if... Could you create two virtual networks, one that was open to the public, one that was closed within the environment there? I have not yet implemented that, but there is a way that you can actually go, and I think it is, uh, let me see here. Let me see here. Let me see. A point to site, right? Mm -hmm. Or a point? You can do uh, point to site would be one machine to your, yep. your site. Yep. Site to site is you connect the router up to the Azure virtual network, and your network becomes the one network, and yep. routing information to plan. But to simulate a DMZ, because all the firewall stuff is done at the cloud app. Yeah. Service, right? yeah. And then you've got networks under your cloud service. So you can have two cloud services, one that you would consider like your on prem behind the firewall stuff that you want anybody to get into. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then the other one that would be um, exposed to the public for say your web server, and then you can pump a whole you could expose a port back into your mm -hmm. your other one for SQL server. So if you had a Yep. A web application with a SQL server, you have the SQL server on one cloud app, mm -hmm. the web server on the other cloud app, and go between the two. So you've, you've got you know, a couple layers of abstraction between the yep. public and the SQL server. Yep. And in fact, it will take, in fact, it got me almost uh, six months just to learn up to where I got here. So. It takes time. So the virtual networking is definitely a very interesting topic, especially in the cloud, where you can actually play around with it. So uh, sometime 
in the near future, hopefully, I'll, I'll hopefully give a session on how to implement two virtual machines of two SQL servers talking together. So the, the pricing, do they charge you just for what you're actually using? They don't charge you for what you build and raise, build and raise, build and raise, build and raise? Uh, no. no. Just, it's just, turn just watch this turn off. So yep. you don't even have to delete it. Just turn it off. Yes. But there's a distinction there. Forget turn it off. If you go into the, yeah. if you go into the server itself and shut it down, from, yeah. the, from a Azure standpoint, it's still running. Yeah, it's still running. You have to go to Azure and say shut down. Yeah. And shut it down and stop it. So, so like this, you actually go inside here. You see the shutdown. So you say yes. Shutting down the virtual machine that way. Yes. Yeah. What about the storage? The storage is attached to it. You're still charged for, but it's the cost is going. I mean, I've got at any given time, I've got three virtual machines, three small virtual machines running. One four by seven, one's a domain controller, two are um, part of a four node cluster, simple cluster with always on availability groups. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a virtual network that's a 24 by seven that's site to site between my house and the um, And I've got several terabytes worth of storage in my bill and my is about 26 bucks. And then I've got other machines that I turn on and turn off. I'll turn them on for a demo and turn them off. Yep. That's exactly what I do. So as soon as my demo is done, you can see all these are stop, stopped, and deallocated. So that means that they're done. You're no longer going to be charged. So I, in the initial days of Azure, I had this thing where I wanted to learn uh, SQL Server and, uh, and get up and running fast on certain, some of the certain features. I forgot to turn it off uh, the previous night. And I had built a real large machine, and before you know it, my credit is over. <laughs> so yeah, it's a pretty interesting thing, and you learn from your experiences, right? So. So I have a weird thing off of one Sure. You have your stuff in the cloud. Yep. That means you don't have your stuff physically. You don't have to physically maintain it. Yep. So when you're in this cloud environment, yep. you have something that breaks, and you have to troubleshoot it the best you can. Yep. Because Microsoft expects you to do it because they're providing. You know, yep. What happens if you can't? Who do you call? If you think